always a pleasure to be in the Southern Hemisphere when it's winter in London. Uh, thank you, Anna Clara, for a heroic task of organizing this meeting. It's very important. It's actually very important. And thank you for the various institutions here at the university that have supported both me and others to come to, to participate in this with you. Um, my talk is going to be in two parts. I realize that I have here an audience, some of whom are very familiar and self-sufficient in gym design, and some of you have never even heard the term before, let alone seen examples. So my talk is going to be in, in, in two different parts. The first is basically my opinion of what geodesign should be doing and is doing, but my opinion is one of many, and there are many people doing things that I'm not interested in under the rubric of geodesign, and I'm sure that what I'm interested in, not everybody else is interested in. So it's, 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 a larging, it's, a, it's an enlarging area of study and practice. Uh, and my view is, is based on a lot of experience, but it's still nonetheless my view. Uh, I will, in the course of that first part, describe very, very quickly the range of studies that, that have been engaged, that I've been engaged in with Tess and Rishi and others in the last two years. But then in the second part, <coughs> I'm going to show one study, but I'm going to show it in a forensic way. I'll, I'll show you what's, what's really the problems in it. As I'm not going to say how wonderful it is. I'm going to say these are, these are serious problems that we have to think about. And there are, there are some ways of solving those problems. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. The, the, main, the main issue, the, the main issue for me is that the world's most important problems are not the ones that are being addressed by most of the universities, most of the researchers, most of the technologies. Uh, there's, a huge, there's a huge effort, an, an, an appropriate huge effort, in the application of the technologies of big data to the management of existing cities. But the reality is that we are building the equivalent of one city of a million people every week in the world. We're not building one city of a million, we're building the equivalent of one city of a million people every week. And, and the question that, that I'm really interested in is what I call the generic question. How do we organize and conduct the very beginning and strategic changes of designing for longer term change in a large multi-system, multi-client and contentious context and one which should not become a zero-sum game. And this is frequently the normal situation. I, I consider this the most important question, the most important problem. It cannot be solved by existing models, because the models are showing that the world is getting worse. And if you want to continue on those models, feel free to project. And it can't be solved by asking people their opinion, because if you think long-term, those people will not be the people you're designing for. You're designing for systems that have a 20-year to a 50-year lifespan, not one year, and not an electoral cycle. So this is a mixture. It's a messy process. It's a, it's a human process, supported by technology. And, and there are no general theorems, there are no general systems, there are no general models. It's a messy process of, in my opinion, a non-zero-sum game, which means I don't know everything. I can't impose it on you. I need to work with other people, and we collectively, including the people of the place, have to figure out what to do. But we have to figure out what to do knowing that we're talking about a longer time frame than us. And that's what makes it complicated. The, 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 the idea of geodesign is, is not really a new idea. The word was invented in the 1990s by three people who didn't know each other. It's, but what, what, what characterizes it, what characterizes it is systems thinking. It, it's not designing by a formal diagram. It isn't. It's, it's analyzing the systems that create life, basically, and then figuring out what to do. It's a complicated process. And it ends up, by the way, with complicated designs. 
Designs that are not easy to understand, not easy to caricature, not easy to diagram as complete syntheses. It is not the design of, um, of Copenhagen or Washington, D.C. or Brasilia. That's not what it, what it is. It, it usually involves proposals for change, impact simulations. It's informed by geography. The, 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 diagrams, the diagrams that create it and the diagrams of solutions vary by geography. Cold places, warm places, rich places, poor peak places, wet peak places, dry peak places. They don't solve the same problems. They don't even define the problems in the same way, let alone solve them in the same way. There's, there's no universal things to copy. And it's usually, but not always, supported by digital technology. Uh, the di digital technology is very useful, it's very important, but if you don't have it, it doesn't stop you from being geodesign. But the, the, the other aspect of it is the idea, the idea that we're changing, we can and probably should change geography by design. And I mean by design the verb sense of the word, by intentional change. Design is a word that has a noun and a verb meaning. The noun is the object, the process is intention, by design. And, and I think that if we don't do it by design, it'll be done to us and not for the better. It's an invented word. And, and it's a very useful word because it implies, it implies a collaborative activity that is not the exclusive territory of any design profession, geographic science, or information technology. It, it's, it's, it's a word out in, in the cloud, if you want. And anybody can say, I'm doing geodesign. And they probably are. Each participant must know and be able to contribute something that the others cannot or do not. Yet during the process, no one needs to lose his or her professional, scientific, or personal identity. I'm not interested in a degree in geodesign or creating somebody called a geo. You're a hydrologist working in geodesign, you're a banker working on geodesign, you're a citizen working in geodesign. It's a, it's a process, it's a methodology if you wish, but it's really a process of designing. I want to pay homage to two people who have influenced at least my view. One is my teacher, Kevin Lynch. I was his first doctoral student. He wrote a book. Uh, he was a real deep thinker about regions, about cities, about people. Uh, he was politically a, a complete Democrat. And um, he, he wrote a very important book called The Theory of Good Urban Form. And it, and it basically had eight principles. Uh, it, I'm going to read them. You can't read them, but I can. It should deal directly with settlement form and its qualities and not be an eclectic application of concepts from other fields. In other words, the, the, four, the solutions come from watching and living and seeing the city and the regions and the rural areas. It doesn't come from the adaptation of linguistics. It doesn't come from the adaptation of mathematics. It's its own area and it needs to be studied so that you can improve it. It, it should connect values of very general and long-range importance to that form and to immediate practical actions about it. In other words, it's not just let's do something now, it's let's think out there and let's do something now. And maybe what we think out there should influence what we do now. That's why the limitation of modeling, you can learn from it, but you can't solve the problem from it. It should be able to deal with plural and conflicting interests and to speak for absent and future clients. That's the limitation of the, 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 the crowdsourcing. You're asking everybody except the people who are going to be there during the life of your study. It's a limitation. It should be appropriate to diverse cultures and to variations in the decision situations, the centralization of power, the stability and homogeneity of values, the level of resources, and the rate of change. The world is complicated. They vary these things, the, the issues that concern stability. And we have to recognize that. Number six, it should be sufficiently simple, flexible, and divisible that it can be used in rapid, partial decisions with imperfect information by lay persons who are the direct users of the places in question. 
In other words, if we have simple data and we can use it complexly, we're better off than if we have complicated data and can't explain it. And if we have partial data and make the right decisions, we're better off than looking for perfect data and never getting to the point of making decisions. It should be able to evaluate the quality of state and process together as it varies over a moderate span of time. Heaven always talked about two generations. What you're, he had, I have had this experience also. What you're doing is you're designing for your grandchildren, even if you're only 25 years old. And if you think that way, most people think that way. If you say 150 years from now, they don't want to talk to you. But if they want to talk about their children and their grandchildren, they'll listen to you. Finally, while at root a way of evaluating settlement form, the concept should suggest new possibilities of form. In other words, we're studying a place, but it, those concepts should, should themselves lead us to a possible changes and new form. In general, it should be a possible theory, not an iron law of development, but one that emphasizes the active purposes of participants and their capacity for learning. The act itself of making the design is seen by him as a learning process to guide action. It's very important. It was not the plan would guide action, but the plan was a learning process of the people to guide action. And the second person that, that is very important is Norbert Wiener. Norbert Wiener was a mathematician, a physicist, and an engineer, a famous teacher at MIT. He, he was involved in the Second World War in solving the big data problem. The big data problem in the 1940s was radar. Radar had been invented, and the English Air Force invented it and used it to put up the airplanes to fight the Germans who were coming to bomb London. And there was so much information that it took so long to process the information that the planes were coming up too late. And he figured out that the, the problem was, a problem, or oh, what's going on? Oh, I press this machine and it goes forward. I'm sorry, that's, that, I, that's why I don't like these machines. What he said, what he said was, the people in this industry, the inventors of the technology and the users of technology did not have a basis for communication. And then, that he wrote a book called Cybernetics, 1948, very important. And he said that in order to have collaboration, you need communication. And you need three things, a shared knowledge of the subject, shared assumptions, and very importantly, a shared language. We were talking before several of us colleagues here, and I said, in California, there are, every county has its own land use classification and its own land use colors. And if you try to make a statewide map and you have to put these together, it's a tower of Babel. Uh, Switzerland has one. In Switzerland, even though there are four languages of people, there's one color for every land use, period. And you have to use that color. And it lets us read each other's maps. Right? So that's, those turn out to be very important. Now, here's where I think we are, and, 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 I'm, and I, I'm, I know that I'm talking in Brazil, and, and I'm, last two weeks ago I was talking in Amsterdam, and it's two very different cultures. I understand all that. But here's where I think we, we really are. Oh, come on. Don't do that to me. Don't do that to me. Oh, I need a Tess. I, I have a regular laser pointer in my bag. Could you buy, buy any? It's in it's in the leather thing. If you got it to me, it would be a real blessing because this is going to happen all night long. Uh, I I want to go back one. Back one. That's it. And now I want to use the laser pointer. And here it is. Good. And the. In a university, in a university, in a university like this, you, you have people who study the world. Most of them are scientists. And, and they, they study the world in this direction. The things that they, that, they look, that they learn, they believe to be true. Regardless of size, scale, climate, geography. And, and they're good at it. 
And what they do is they study the supply of the world and they try to explain this, the supply of the world. <laughs> no. no, no, That's what I want. I'm going to use my finger here for the beautiful slides. Right. And, and what they do really well is they study the, and explain the supply of the world. They observe. They observe, they explain. But if you, they go into the area of public policy, they are normally defensive. In other words, they say, let's protect the supply that's valuable. And all these ideas like sustainability, for example, is a defensive strategy. It's aimed at knowing what you have and protecting what you have that's valuable. I'm caricaturing, I know, but I'm caricaturing pretty tightly. However, if you've got six scientists together and said, what should we protect, they might disagree. If you ask them what we should do, they certainly would disagree. The bird person would say, protect the birds. The tree person would say, protect the trees. The agriculture agronomist might say, grow more corn, which you can't do when you protect the trees and you protect the birds. So they, they, they don't necessarily agree. So these people, these people typically use GIS. They typically use information technologies. They're really good at deciding how much we have and how much we might have. And they're really interested in longer term management. They're interested in, oh, thank you, Tess. Oh, yeah, thanks a lot. Ah, oh, much better. And, and they're interested in the long term management of the globe. And, and I give them credit. But as they go in this direction, they do less and less and worse and worse. In other words, ask, ask the person who manages water for Brazil what they should do about a flood in your basement, they have nothing to say. So it's, it's really good out here and they, they should be praised. The opposite is also true. We have the architects, the landscape architects, the planners, the engineers, the design professions. They're, they're demand-based. In other words, you, you come to them and you say, I want a shopping center, they'll give you a shopping center. They, they want clients who want to change things, much more than to protect them. And they're, they're focusing on offensive strategies, meaning strategies to change things, to build more, or sometimes build less. And they, they work with the people of the place. Their technology is going to be BIM, Building Information Management, which is used in the construction industry. It's very powerful. And the, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, Germany, and the Netherlands now require every project, landscape or building, to be presented to the government in BIM, format in order to get a building permit. So this, this technology of BIM is going to rule the technology of projects and constructions. Get used to it. If you're an architecture faculty member and you're not teaching your students BIM, they're going to have a short professional career. Their emphasis is on visualization and shorter term management. They want to know tomorrow morning what the heat is in the building so we can manage the city's heat loss. And as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, they get worse and worse and worse. Don't tell me that the architects, as a profession, can design Minas Gerais. But legally, they do. Because you come from the Spanish tradition of the 15th century, where engineers and architects have the power legally to make plans at territorial scale, something that they're not prepared to do intellectually. It's a huge mistake for Brazil. So the problem is this, they do really well here, but if you get six architects together, they're not going to agree. Six planners together aren't going to agree. Six clients aren't going to agree. And the problem is these scales where the real change is occurring at a public policy and as a project level is the place where the scientists do the least and worst and the designers do the least and worst because nobody's being trained or educated to work directly at these scales in a cross-cultural, cross-professional, cross-client manner. I think it's a huge problem and we need 10,000 of these people in the next decade. The issue here is 
that at this scale, you need the scientists, you need the designers, you need the people of the place, and you need the information technologists. And the main focus is on the organization of space and time and the strategic design. What I mean by the strategic design, I'll give you an example. When Kubitschek and, and Costa decided to build Brasilia, they didn't have 50 PhDs doing detailed models on big data. They had a map, they had an idea, they drew a map and a diagram and they said, let's build the damn thing. All right? What they did was they used little data complexity. They knew what they were doing in their minds. And, and they made a strategic design decision, which then took generations of architects and planners and lawyers and people to change. And it's changed a lot, I know that. Okay. But the strategy was the important decision. What should we pick? Was the first important decision. It had several possible sites. I know that. <coughs> Lucia Costa was a teacher of mine for three weeks. And, and we talked about how did the decision actually get made? And he said, well, we made it at dinner. And, and on a small day. And it's good, it's fine, let it go. Now negotiation is a pervasive process. And it's especially important because these people disagree and those people disagree and those people disagree. And they're not going to agree in the abstract. All the planning theory in the world that says that we have to decide our goals before we make our design is crazy because the people who don't agree don't share the goals. It doesn't work. So it has to be negotiation. And if you look closely at the ideas, the ideology of the contributors, those are negotiations. Let's go to the designers, the, the, the scientists. This is the famous Brundtland diagram from the United Nations, 1987. What they basically say is that sustainability is a function of environment, society, and economy. Equally? Everywhere? Surely not. So even if you're a scientist dealing with sustainability, you have to negotiate between environment, society, and economy. And let's take the average architect, Vitruvius. Vitruvius basically said, firmitas, utilitas, venustas. That you have to be durable, useful, and beautiful. <coughs> Equally? Surely not. I had a teacher, digression, I had a teacher in, when I was an architecture student in my second year. And he said, Steinitz. That they called you that. If ever you're faced with three choices, realize, realize that you can only control two of them. And he said, there are three things that are important. Quantity, quality, and cost. And you can only control two. If you have so much quantity and so much quality, you don't control the cost. If you want to control the cost, you can either control quantity or quality in some balance. So these are negotiations. They're always negotiations. And if you add the people of the place who don't agree, the technologies which vary, these are the negotiations that are necessary for these people to work together at this scale. And to do that, they need a common language and a common set of techniques. And nobody knows what those are because they are an architect or a scientist or something. None of us knows enough. But if we solve the problem, what's going to happen is the design will move to this side and be managed in a worldwide database. Or it will be managed for Belo Horizonte in a BIM system for the whole city, which probably will occur within the next five years. Technologically, it should be occurring already. That one will be based in GIS, and that will probably be based in, in BIM. And the time that we have to do that, that is very short, in my opinion. It's between now and 2050, if you believe the United Nations. Well, I'm interested in that situation. I'm interested in how do you actually design, in a contentious process, 
in a contentious environment where everybody's negotiating their own ideas and ideas with somebody else. I've written a book about it, Framework for Geodesign. It proposes questions. There are no models in the book. There are no answers, but there are lots of questions. It's in Spanish. It's in Portuguese. It's in Italian. It's in Portuguese, thanks to Anna Clara, who translated it. And it's in Chinese. It's in Japanese. And it's fine. It works. It proposes color coding. These people have to get together. The people of the place are purple. The design professionals are orange. The scientists are blue. And the technologies are green. And one of the characteristics of this collaboration is you never know who has the ideas. The, uh, the concept that the architect has the ideas is nonsense. It could come from anybody. The question is what you do with them is important. And they don't agree. And it's never linear. Even though it's presented linearly in a book, the act of, of designing cannot be linear. You learn as you go, but you have to finish. And it has a workflow. It has a workflow that says each of these groups needs to decide what's important. They need to organize information. They need to understand processes. They need to evaluate. And this can be done by experts or by people who know something or by anybody. Actually, I don't believe in crowdsourcing. I believe in people who know something. And I think that the crowd could know something, but there's no guarantee. And then you have to have diagrams of policies and projects. You have to combine them. They each have a time and a cost. You have multiple designs, and you have to test their impacts. And Rishi Balal has designed a software system called GeoDesign Hub that implements that. And it implements it in a way that has been adapted very flexibly to a wide variety of projects because it has no data and it has no models inside. It's a management of information workflow, not answers to the questions. And it's very important that these are the people who are driving the system. We've done, using the software, there have been about 2,000 people who know how to use it, and there's about 100 projects. And they're all over the world. Some of the most important are right here in Belo Horizonte. The stuff that we saw this morning was wonderful about the favela projects that, that Ana Clara students have done with the city and with the favela people. The work that I tend to do is done fast. I, I work with people, with other people, with Tess and with Rishi and, and colleagues here sitting in the room. Um, in two days. I like, I, like to, I like to get people together who haven't worked together and say, let's take the most complicated problems that we can and see what we can say in two days. I, I've always believed that having more time does not give you better answers. Having short time and a methodology that works reasonably well will get you a, a, an answer that's just as good and probably better faster. And speed is not trivial. Speed is important. There are several reasons for this. One of them is to work through a framework in order to understand it. Another one, when applying geodesign, and there's little time in small data. We had a, a presentation today about what do you do after an earthquake when people have to re decide what to rebuild. And two graduate students presented today uh, a very brave problem, very fine. When, you're, when you need to start fast to identify the central issues and options, when you have people who disagree, one of the things you want to do is to get them to tell you what the basis of their understanding of the situation is. And by starting fast, they, they, they will give you what they, they, my experience is that they will give you views of what they think are important. And you'll realize how different they are, and then you have to proceed. Sometimes it takes a design to know what the questions are. Sometimes what you want to do is show people one or more designs in order for them to tell you what they think the real questions are. 
How do they decide what a good design is? Is a very important question. How do they know what they want? And finally, when it takes a design to know what's really wanted, sometimes you can show a range of designs and say, that's why I like that one. I really want that. But they sometimes say, I want that from that design, and I want that from that design. These are some of the projects, very quickly, two or three slides for, for five or six projects. These are the kinds of things that GeoDesign has done with, we've worked on these projects. Um, we, we work typically about one a month. And they take about three months to set up because the people have to get on their schedules. But technically, it doesn't take that long to set up this, the, the technology. The question here is the, the city of Seattle, Washington, which is very proud of its sustainability laws. And the question is, will the sustainability laws be valid in the year 2050? So what was happening here is a, is a, a river basin in which one of the tests of sustainability is, does it still involve the life of salmon? Do the salmon fish still go in that river in the year 2050? And so what happened was we had teams growing the city. And, and one, of the teams, one of the teams started here, and by the time two days finished, they had made 19 different versions of their design. 19 different versions by learning from other teams and by iterating. And what we found out, go forward. Okay, what's going on here? What we found out was by 2050, the city would have violated every one of its rules. And in order to change, they have to invest in high density living along transit corridors and change all the zoning options of, from the city. And they refused to do it. So we told them it's not going to work. You, this is what you need to do, and they decide not to do it. Life goes on. This is Hampi. Hampi in the 15th century in India was one of the, was probably the third largest city in the world. And Indian tourism is doubling very rapidly. India is getting rich. And Indian tourism in India is a huge growth problem. And this is a workshop in which Rishi and I were in London, Prashant was in Davis, California, and Mohan and 20 people were in Bangalore, and we ran the workshop from London in Bangalore, because it's all web-based, and we don't have to be, we don't have to be in Belo Horizonte to run a workshop in Belo Horizonte, all right? And so we had six teams, ecology, heritage, international tourism, local village life, local village tourism, and the state government, each making plans and then negotiating a final plan. And we did that in one day, in one day. This is Savannah, Georgia. Uh, Rosanna organized that study. Rosanna organized this. The city has to double, but they're going to lose half of the land of the county due to sea rise by the year 2050. We created a bunch of groups. They negotiated and negotiated this design. And that's 2050. And we learned something that's really, really important. And that is, there is no solution for the city of Savannah unless they go into other counties and other states. And in America, that's not done. In Brazil, it's not done. When we did the study of Belo Horizonte, we bounded the study area by the boundary of Belo Horizonte. We know nothing about what's across the boundary. But this was the, a problem in which the solution had to be across the political boundary. This is Mulrani in Ireland. This is a village of 250 people, which was 500 people before the famine of 1848. And they were about to be less than 250. And come on. And less than 250 people means you lose your elementary school, which means you lose the village life. And this, the villagers had spent four years trying to figure out what to do. And one of the faculty members at, at the university in Dublin lives nearby, and it, and it caused them to invite us to do a workshop. So we did a workshop with 25 people, 10% of the town. And they, they wanted one condition. They wanted nothing to do with professionals or with 
digital data. So the farmer, in the first 45 minutes, drew the evaluation map. The school teacher drew the evaluation map for institutions. The garage owner drew the transportation opportunities map. There was no GIS data. There were no computers. There were no, no professionals. But we used computer software to manage the design. And that's the design. And the real product was the people, not the design. Because they then went back and they made their own plan after making the plan in a workshop. They had other workshops later on, and they now have a plan. So this is like your favela problem. Let the people make their own maps. Why not? And assume that the process is educating the people, not making the plan. And then they'll make the plan. This is Arizona State University. This is a university which bought two other university type places. This is the university. It's a branch of Arizona State. And they had to connect in an existing city, Phoenix, these three. And so the workshop was held with the, the department chairman, the deans, the president of the university, and the president of development of the university. This was an institutional design. And they negotiated a design, including faculty housing and the linking of these three institutions. It was, how do, you, how do you triple a university? How do you organize it? This was, this was one and a half days. This is me teaching faculty from 12 African universities how to use the software. And the problem was, let's triple the university that was our host, which was the Agricultural University of Kenya. This is the most interesting one that we've participated in. This is a small town in rural Utah, where we did a project, and one of the faculty members was approached by a high school geography teacher who said, can I use this technology with my 13-year-old high school students? And she said, yes, we'll teach them how to use it. So, in nine hours, 60 13-year-olds made a design for their town to double it. They built the models, they built the designs, the diagrams, they made the designs, they made two versions of the designs as farmers, environmentalists, developers, and older folks. And their product was a 3D geodesign hub showing where they were going to grow their, their town. And I liked working with nerd software. I really liked how interactive it was. Wait. We got to help influence something. I enjoyed how seriously we were treated and that our opinion mattered. We got to design and think for ourselves. Why not? And do they do any differently than graduate students? This is, again, a project Rosada helped to organize. This is the coastal zone. This is the same size as the Netherlands. It's 12 counties in Georgia, each of which has the legal responsibility to make its own plan, with a regional agency that has to coordinate those plans. And that's a negotiation. And what we learned here with this was two very important days. We had come on, teams for different counties negotiating with each other. What we learned is that if we built a, a network of conservation, a green infrastructure, for an area the size of the Netherlands, today, with today's values and today's data, we would be making a huge mistake. Because the network is going to be changed by sea rise and by development. And if we know about development and we know about sea rise, we would buy different land. It's, it's a very important question. What's the time of your design? There, uh, Kevin Lynch wrote a book called What Time Is This Place? But what's the time of your design? It's tomorrow, is it tomorrow morning? Or is it 2050 or 2030? And the, the design will be different 
depending upon the time horizon. And this is Yosano. Yosano is a city in Japan that's going to lose half its population in the next 20 years. The Japanese problem is the declining population, not the growing population. And this, this is, oh, come on. And this is a project that ended in, in, a, in a 3D city engine animation showing what the city could be if it had half the number of people. Come on. Go forward. Why is that not going forward? Last year, Anna Clara organized a very brave study. We were well aware of the, the, the crisis in the iron quadrilateral and the, the lawsuits. I were well aware of it. And she organized a workshop with many of you who were in it, not many, some of you were in it, with a mixture of Minas Gerais, Bella Harja, mining interests, and NGOs that were against the mining interests because of the disaster. And during the course of it, these people worked in mixed teams, and they negotiated a design. Oh, come on, what's going on here? What is going on here? Excuse me for a minute. I'm not sure what to do. I'm going to escape. I'm going to escape. These these projects, these projects and many others, had at their core, had at their core that the end game, the end game of the process was a negotiation. And and now I'm going to enter the second part of my talk, which is seven o'clock, and it's going to go really fast. Many times, many times, not always, you'll have a group of people who don't agree. They'll create a team for geodesign. The team will try to figure out what the objectives are. It'll make a design, it'll make a second design, it'll make a presentation, it'll make a presentation. This is very, very typically the way planning bureaus work. A group of people responsible for making a plan, a group of clients who don't agree, you try to get them to agree, you make a plan, and then you spend a lot of effort to present the plan and try to convince those people that you've got a good one. That's really typical. The problem is that they have nothing else to compare it to. They really don't know whether it's a good plan. They'll never know whether it's the best one you can do. An alternative, which is very common in, U in Europe, is you have a team of people who disagree. One of two things happen. You either get a group of design people, or planners, or whatever they are, and inside a, a company, Siemens, for example, or IBM, or any of the, or Arab, or you name the large, or AECOM, the large integrated companies, they might create small groups to make alternatives. And they might take them to the client, and the client might say, no, yes, maybe, no, maybe, no. And you carry two or three forward, and then they say, I like that one. That's very common. That's a competition model as well, if you, if you run a project by a competition. The problem is, if they pick this one, is there nothing in the others that was better than something in the one they picked? And the answer is there probably was. As the project gets bigger, the likelihood is extremely high that there's something in the second and third best design that's better than something in the first best design in a competition. So collaborative negotiation takes a different attitude towards how do you make the design. The first attitude is that every one of the colors that disagrees deserves its own design. So you, you, do, you try to figure out who are the conflicting groups, who are the interest groups. One, two, three, four, five, six, there could be many. And each one of them makes their own design with their own team. And during the course of making the design, 
There are presentations in which they can share and negotiate informally by saying, well, I think your shopping center is better than mine, but I think my hospital is better than yours. So why don't we make an agreement? I'll take yours, this one, you take mine, this one, and we'll both take her road, because her road is really better than our road. And all information becomes public rather than private property. Everything becomes public property, shared by everybody. And then you figure out how to get people to agree to work together. And, it's, and we use associate brand. I'll talk about that in a, in a couple of minutes, really quickly. And what it does is it organizes bilateral discussion and bilateral negotiation until you finally end with the design. And the difference is that these people are involved in the process. At a minimum of negotiation, at a maximum of doing the whole design. So they know that the design is developing toward their interests. It's a very different view. And that's why geodesign seems useful. This is the oldest suburb of Sydney, Australia. Downtown Sydney is here. Captain Cook flew, came to Botany Bay here. And I'm going to go very, very fast. And I'm going to skip some slides. The why questions. Well, Sydney is going to grow from 4.7 million to about 8 million. I picked this case study because it's large it's roughly in scale, and it's roughly in scale with Kapuli. So it's a city that's going to double in about by 2050. And the city does not want to grow outward. It wants to consider the possibility of growing upward. In this area, well, in the area that we're going to work on, an existing built area they want to put 180,000 new units of housing for 360,000 people. They're going to double the population. They're going to change the airport. They have to rebuild the green and blue infrastructure. It's a big project. The people in the workshop are the planning staff of the Sydney region, plus the planners of the local district. There are three districts. Now, I picked this project to illustrate because what it does, in almost every city government or state government, people work in silos. If you're doing a project, you have to meet here with this person, and here with this person, and here, and here, and here. And by the time you meet here, what this person saw has changed. And what we're doing here is we're saying, get these people together for two days, solve the problem. These are all people who know each other. Theoretically, they work together, but in practice, they work separately. Come on. The issues are green infrastructure, blue infrastructure, tourism, education, commerce and industry, high density housing, middle density housing, vehicular transit, and pedestrian and bicycle. And what's interesting is that this Thank you. This is the floor area that has to go into an existing area. It's the floor area that has to go into an existing area. Now what they're doing in this workshop is not making a plan, but they're deciding if it's even reasonable to propose a plan to double the density of this place. It's their own internal study. It's not a plan for the place. There are no people of the place, except the, the planners of the place. It's the first step to deciding whether they're going to make that policy. I gave a lecture like this, only to professionals this time. And this is the system that we're going to use. This is Chris Pettit, who is professor at the University of New South Wales, who organized it. This is Rishi, and we're teaching on, this is day one, 10 o'clock in the morning. So this is always going to be the time of day. By 10 o'clock, we have taught the people how to use the software. This is, can be done very, very quickly. Then now, making diagrams of policies and projects in ten system, nine system-based teams. And these are professionals. These are not 
the people of the farmers and the school teacher. These are serious people who know what they're doing. And it takes them an hour to make 10 diagrams of policies and projects that they've already been thinking about. This is a project. It's upgrade the wastewater treatment plant. It has a cost, it has an area, and it has a time. And these are the diagrams. Some of them are imported from GIS. Some of them are drawn by hand. And we started out at 11 o'clock in the morning with about 200 diagrams. First day, 200 diagrams around 11 o'clock, 11.30. And it's now we, 12 o'clock we have lunch. 1 o'clock, we're now going to make designs in six teams. Environment, housing, university, and employment, public service, tourism and recreation, and compactness. And there they are. They're making a design by picking problem policies and projects. Each project you can press on it, and it goes into the design. It tells you what it is. Many of you here have worked on this with the software. You know what I'm, I'm showing you. And by, by about 2.30 in the afternoon, they have their first design, and they assess their impacts. Purple means it's done well. Orange means it's not too, doing well. And they got an awful lot of assessment impact assessments by about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. At 2.30, yeah, at 2.30, we taught them about timelines and budgeting, timelines and costs, and 3D. This is a one-button 3D system. You press one button, and on a fast computer, it comes up in 3D in about three minutes. So by 2.30 in the afternoon, we were in policy and project diagrams, timeline, and cost. And what was very, very interesting is at 3 o'clock they were making their second design. But many of the teams, several of them, were designing in timeline and cost. Their budgets required too much money late in the project. And they had to change the design by changing the budget. That's really important. Because if you want to make something that has to be paid for over a long period of time, you better have a budget that looks like this. Not one that looks like this, because you're not going to get the money back. So this was the first design, and this is the second design. So look at the differences. So by 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, we had a second design by each team. And now it's day two. And it's 9 o'clock in the morning. And at this time, we're telling the teams, make version 3, but talk to people because you've seen their design. Everybody has everybody's design on their computer. Go to a place you can see everybody's design. So this woman here is talking to this man and saying, we want you to give me something from your design because it's very good. Tell us which diagrams you use. We tell us that. Because in the end, you want people to coalesce around diagrams. And this is version number three. Now, this is the important part of my lecture, and I'm not going to talk for more than about 10 more minutes. This is a dashboard. It's not a dashboard for one design, it's a dashboard for six designs. And the problem is this. This is, in my opinion, the best decision model. This is the best design. This met the program requirements the best. This was the best on environmental impact, and this was the least costly design. The question is, which is the best design? How do you pick the best design? And if you only have one design, you'll never know that there's another design that's better. So why make only one design? That makes no sense at all. So at 10.30, each design was presented, and all the designs were in the same color code. And nobody could speak for more than three minutes. In other words, I, the presentation of a complicated design had to be done in three minutes, because everybody could understand each other's designs. And now we're showing comparison tools and negotiation tools, and we've built a whole bunch of them. For example, this is the combined analysis. This is everybody's design. Every diagram of policy and projects dumped on top of each other. 
And if these colors represent the same colors as the color code, you know they agree. They agree, they agree, they agree. They don't agree here. They don't agree here. They agree, they agree, they agree, they agree. They don't agree here. They don't agree here. I can tell by the colors if there's disagreement. So maybe we have half the problem solved. We agree on it. And we only can focus where the colors are buddy. This is frequency. There are six teams. And those of you who are in the front can see there are numbers. That box has a number five in it. Five teams picked that diagram of a policy or a project. That's a project. And the software allows you to say, show me the diagrams that all six teams agree. Five teams. Four teams. Show me half the teams agree. And it'll build a design. It takes a second or two. But this is a sociogram. A sociogram was invented in 1934 by school teachers who wanted to sit students in school next to their friends. So they asked each student who your friends are. And then they did an analysis. There's now software for this, but I like to do it human. So each team had to evaluate each other team as to whether they thought they could be partners in a new design or never. And we analyzed those and we said these two are very similar, these are similar, let them make a design. This is the next one and it's powerful, so they have to convince this team to make a new design. These two have to convince this one, which is powerful, to make a design. And then the last two are the two most powerful ones and they have to negotiate in public. Then we have a tool. Two designs, these are the diagrams. You can take that design and show any, any land use. This is the housing pattern. So they can just say, this project is different. Yes or no? This project is different. Yes or no? Maybe I give you this one, you give me this one. And they build the design. And this is live. You press that button, it goes in. You press that diagram, and it goes out. So there's the first design negotiation. This is the public one. At 3.30, it's in public. One team, the other team. They agreed, between, before they began, they agreed on these diagrams. They were in both designs. Then they're negotiating, system by system, project by project. It takes an hour to an hour and a half. And finally, the last decision is where the metro stop should be. And that's the final design. That's its impacts. That's its cost. That's its detailed impacts. That's its budget. Public money, private investment, and build out. That's a very good budget line. Public money for infrastructure, build it, public investment and private investment for housing and other facilities, and it builds out. And this is a video that I don't have time to show, but these are interconnected. When I, this is a timeline, I'm sorry, I'll go back. This is a timeline and I can demonstrate it in the video. As the place grows, the budget projects get built or not, and the budget changes. And it can be used as a management tool. That's the final design. And this is based on small data used complexly, and it tells you where the priorities are for new green infrastructure. And then somebody else in another technology has to design it as in great detail. But that's the priorities. That's the project that then has to become 150 projects for architects, planners, landscape architects, and lawyers. We do have the ability to tell you who did what and when. Of the 200 projects that we began with, not one original project was in the final design. Not one. We had 400 diagrams by the time we were done. And the final diagram, the final design had about 100. These are the, the, the bottom line. Did you find green is good and, blue and red is bad? Did you find the process difficult or easy? Most people found it relatively easy. How well did your team's interest, how well were they addressed and included in the final design? This is important. Most people felt they were listened to and that their ideas were incorporated. Maybe by somebody else. Do you agree with the final design? No, not really, but mostly yes. But this is the, the question that, that we found very interesting. 
Which tools did you find most helpful or influential? Number one, the negotiation process. Number two, the tools for comparing different designs that we can borrow from each other. I want to end with this. It's important, I think. I wrote this in 1999 on a piece of paper that I kept. 1999. Designing a scenario-based study of alternative futures is an art. It requires judgment. It is not a science, although it depends on science. There are no perfect formulae, but there are methods. There is no universal toolkit, but there are tools. You cannot copy an example, but you can gain experience. Thank you.